Pope Francis shocks world, endorses Donald Trump for president. There's a shocker. According to this highly reputable-looking website, uh, the Vatican had decided enough was enough over the course of the 2016 election. Uh, His Holiness the Pope decided to break with centuries of precedent, reach into U.S. electoral politics, and endorse one candidate over another. This was, on Facebook, the most engaged and shared story of the 2016 election. It received almost a million shares. It was very, very salacious, very, very shocking, and very, very fake. Be it that it had been that story alone, but there were tens of thousands of stories like this one, which consistently outperformed uh, the real news that was being reported. They didn't all get as much engagement as the story about the Pope, but it didn't much matter. Uh, If you saw the shocking headline, that was enough. Fun fact, two-thirds of all the stories shared on Facebook are never read or clicked on, so it's only the headline that matters. After the election, there was a moment of reckoning in this country. Uh, The general terminology for this phenomenon was, some people called it fake news, some people called it false news. I prefer the term misinformation, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. What misinformation is, uh, how it works, and what we can do about it. So what is misinformation? I think this definition is the best, which was uh, part of Dictionary.com's 2018 Word of the Year. Misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of whether there is intent to mislead. And that distinction about intent is important. Because you have a few bad actors in the system who are trying to mislead folks consciously, but uh, the vast majority of misinformation is just stuff that's passively absorbed, passed on, and shared without much critical thought. But the distinction is, even if there's no malicious intent in it, if people see it, if they believe it, if they're incited to action, then it has just as much negative effect on society as a whole. And unfortunately, we go well beyond now the uh, 2016 election. We've seen misinformation uh, affect and infiltrate democratic societies. It's led to the rise of cyber authoritarians around the world. Uh, It sparked civil violence, ethnic and religious tension, and one day it may even start wars. So how did we get here? There are going to be two high-dollar terms, the first of which is disintermediation, which is easier as it looks like. Disintermedia, taking out that thing in the middle. Disintermediation means taking out the middleman. And when communications theorists in the late 80s and 90s were thinking about the political and social economic effects of the internet, this term was all the rage. Uh, They predicted accurately how a company like Amazon might obviate the need for a big box retailer. You could order, get your product directly. Same thing, you don't need a taxi company and a system of uh, licensing if you can just use Lyft and Uber. Same thing for traditional dating and Tinder. But A lot of people were most excited about the implications of disintermediation for what it might do to how we consume information in general, Uh, the media system, broadcast media. Because traditionally, if you're trying to get your news, you'd uh, listen to a radio broadcast or television broadcast uh, in which stories were presented to you, a select number, which had been reported by designated people and then edited by others. This system represented a series of gatekeepers who were basically controlling uh, what narratives people had exposure to and therefore what they could believe. And if you're really excited about the growth of the internet, and particularly if you have some economic incentive to see it grow, uh, you're very happy about the idea of breaking the system of gatekeepers, of what the internet makes possible, where anyone with a good idea would be able to broadcast to everyone or to reach out and instantaneously communicate with anyone else in the world. What they foresaw was a kind of uh, glorious free market for information, where everyone would have their attention, they could give it to information as they pleased, but it would be the best and most noble stuff to which you give your information, that, or your attention, that which would be best for society. That's how they saw the revolution going. But 
as we know now, that's not the way things went. It's not the best and most socially good and just stuff which warrants your attention. It's the most salacious headlines. It's the stuff that drives you to outrage or anger. It's a process over time which can addict you and excite you. And uh, there's a point where you can almost no longer detach yourself from this constant stream of outrageous headlines. And the important thing here is that it doesn't have to be true. In fact, it's easier if it's not. If you don't have to worry about any objective basis for the sorts of stories you're crafting, uh, you can invent any facts you want. Because what you really care about, all you care about, is whether if you're one of these misinformation merchants, you only care if someone's going to click on it and accord it their attention. And as we think about how misinformation spreads through the internet, social media, the information environment, I really like to think about the, the term we have for something that gets a lot of attention, going viral. Because thinking about the spread of information in terms of a virus is an effective frame through which to do so. So how does a virus work? Well, it doesn't affect everyone at once. And some people are more susceptible than others. What a virus does, and what misinformation does, is target vulnerable populations. And traditionally, we probably all grew up hearing it. Uh, the thinking of older and wiser folks was that it was millennials, and now Gen Z, who would be most susceptible to misinformation because they spent all of their time on the internet, therefore would be most exposed to it. But that's not really true. We tend to be a bit more incredulous in the information that we absorb. We know that people are trying to manipulate us. Uh, so we take a bit more caution when we're uh, absorbing particular items. Instead, the most vulnerable population are old folks, folks specifically over the age of 65. In fact, we have new cutting edge research from two NYU professors here that shows that people over the age of 65 are seven times more likely to share misinformation than those in the age group of 18 to 29. And why is this? Well, it's because older folks came to the internet a little bit later. Uh, I just turned 30, which is crazy. But uh, I grew up with Facebook. People a little bit older, Facebook was the locus of their social life. Now folks who move on Instagram, Snapchat, who knows what comes next. But if you were older, you weren't an early adopter of these technologies. You probably jumped on Facebook around 2013 or 2014 to keep up with your grandkids around the same time they were leaping to other platforms. That meant instead of growing up in this environment, you were jumping into this fully formed information ecosystem where you had thousands of people trying to, trying to grab your attention and mislead you using a whole host, a whole toolkit to which you had no prior exposure. That is what made older people uniquely vulnerable. And if we want to think internationally, uh, this is also an explanation for why, in some nations, we see misinformation lead to more drastic and terrible consequences. Because if you live in the Philippines or India, your experience with the internet in general is drastically different. You've gotten social media platforms a lot newer, a lot more recently. You have not developed that same discernment. So as a consequence, you're more vulnerable. But None of us are immune. Even if it starts with that vulnerable population, once it's entered a certain network, it can quickly spread to you. And the second high dollar word here is homophily. It means literally love of the same. It means if we are, if someone in our social network, a group of people with whom we're already familiar, shares a particular piece of content, we are much more likely to believe it and then to pass it on in kind. The greatest predictor of whether or not something is believed, a certain claim is believed, is familiarity. If you've seen something before, uh, you're more likely to pass it on. A lot of people, when they initially saw that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump, didn't necessarily believe it, but they weren't necessarily click on it either. They didn't give it that much attention. But if a few people in their network started sharing it, they were much more likely to share it in kind, because they didn't want to miss out just in case it was true. Now, Homophily is not a bad thing. Homophily is actually, this, this basis of trust is how human beings have built societies. We have a certain social network. We have to trust them, because trust is how we get stuff done. But the trouble is, homophily traditionally was your family, it was your neighbors, it was folks down the street, a smaller number of people with whom you could interact on a regular basis. 
the internet short-circuited this whole process. Because now your network can be people around the world. It can be thousands of people. And you don't accord, you still don't accord uh, that much scrutiny to these claims. So none of us are immune to homophily. And that's, again, how it spreads like a virus. And now let's reflect on two examples of misinformation, the first of which I think most people in this room will be familiar with, and that's the fire Festival, which is my favorite story ever regarding the internet. In brief, uh, a bunch of fabulists and con men get together and decide to throw a music festival. They're going to throw the most ambitious one in history. They choose a Bahamian island with no access to electricity, no running water. They're going to put the tickets at a few thousand, and they're going to try to sell the place out. Not typically a recipe for success. They also have no planning experience, and none of them have ever run these festivals before. Again, it doesn't sound like they're going to do a great job, but they had one stroke of genius, and that was to take all the money they were getting and invest it into the most ambitious, expensive trailer for a music festival in history. Uh, they flew out 20 Instagrams to this Bahamian island. They spent millions of dollars. They paid Kylie Jenner. 250 grand to do one sponsored Instagram post advertising the fire festival. Kylie Jenner reached 100 million people on her Instagram account. So what was once this obscure thing suddenly becomes the hottest event in town. Not only does fire sell out, it overbooks. And through the process of homophily, once you had your friends talking about it, you were much less inclined to scrutinize it, much more likely to want to go to it in kind. Of course, planning is everything. Just because it sounds like it's going to be a great time uh, doesn't mean it's going to be. They neglected the basic planning. They didn't have anything put together. Folks who went to the Bahamas showed up to a literal humanitarian disaster complete with FEMA tents. The Bahamian government had to work overtime to evacuate these poor millennials back to the US. But misinformation can also be a lot more serious. I have pictured here just some uh, content that trafficked Sri Lankan social media last year. To the left, we see a claim that the Muslim minority, members of the Muslim minority, are hoarding 23,000 sterilization pills that they intend to use against the Buddhist majority. And then to the right, we see WhatsApp traffic between a few Buddhist ultranationalists who are pissed off about this, and they're not going to let it stand. They've sent pictures of the weapons they're going to use to ensure that these sterilization pills are never put into use. And then we see the result. Over the course of three days, because of this viral misinformation, we have a Buddhist mob who descend on Muslim-majority settlements, they burn houses, they burn mosques, they beat people, they burn one man alive. The Sri Lankan government has to declare a state of emergency explicitly because of this false rumor. And I want to be clear that social media does not cause these ethnic and religious tensions, but it sure exacerbates it. And I think it was a Sri Lankan presidential advisor who put it best. The germs are ours, but Facebook is the wind. And just as we've seen it in Sri Lanka, uh, we've seen it just last week in France in an attack against the Roma there. We've seen it in transphobic attacks in Brazil. We've seen it as the root cause of the ongoing Rohingya genocide in Myanmar. We see it all over the world. And it's difficult to overstate the immensity of the challenge because we have never had communication systems in place with as much influence and power as the ones we have now. If you think about the role of Facebook in the world, you can't compare it anymore to any one country. Facebook is the second largest continent after the Asia Pacific. With 2.3 billion people, it is just about to become the world's largest religion. And all of that accumulated misinformation, the falsehoods, the things that, that impel us to action and and test our shared sense of reality. It's useful to think of this as almost a kind of pollution. Because even if you are smart and discerning enough to not fall for it, you're still suffering the consequences. We all are. 
So what can we do about it? Most folks in this room don't work for the government. They can't write the laws we need to address misinformation. Most people here don't work for the big Silicon Valley companies that run this information domain. So unfortunately, they can't make the algorithmic shifts we need. But there is still something we as individuals can do, and it's the mission that I want to leave you all with. The next time you see one of your friends snapping, sharing, Instagramming, whatever, a claim that is self-evidently untrue, you should reach out to them. You should comment. You should not let it go. Now, there's a certain way you should go about this. You cannot be confrontational if you reach out to someone who's sharing obvious misinformation. Confrontation, telling someone that they're wrong, leads to uh, arousal. Not the good kind, but the kind which uh, impels a fight or flight reaction. You are calling them out. You are testing their view of the world. They will never take you seriously, and you can never get anything done that way. I think we've all been in internet arguments. I don't think we've ever won any of them, because you can't win them that way. Instead, you reach out to them. Preferably, you shift it to an offline medium, but you talk to them. And that leads to the second part. As you engage with this person who's spreading this claim that is self-evidently untrue, you don't just give them the facts. You don't say, climate change is real. Here are the temperatures. Or, like, it's absurd that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. He didn't. You can't approach it that way. Instead, you take the basis of their claim as true. Then you empathize with them, and you work together to think through the implications of what they believe. OK, so the Pope endorsed Donald Trump as he endorsed other people. What do you think the Catholic Church thinks about all this? What particular qualities about Trump led the Pope to endorse him? You tease out the underlying basis of that belief. And oftentimes, you can guide that person to then reassess what they believe. You won't always be successful, but it is the best thing you can do. And I'll close with this. As you consciously engage people who are sharing misinformation, also continuously reassess what you believe. Because none of us are immune. Even the most incredulous, skeptical of us can still fall for claims, can still get caught up in these echo chambers, are still vulnerable to the forces of homophily. But this is our generational challenge. And we should reach out as best we can to stop misinformation where we see it. We owe it nothing less to those around us, and we owe nothing less to ourselves. Thank you very much.